We do all kinds of things here at Word in Your Ear. Video casts like this. Podcasts like this. Crowdcast events with famous authors. Live quizzes. And we can guarantee to make your next birthday one you'll never forget. There's only one way to guarantee getting all of this, to getting it before anybody else, and that's to sign on to be a supporter on Patreon. Full details at this address. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Welcome to another edition of Word in Your Attic, where uh, light entertainment for dark times is our proud intent. <laughs> we are delighted to be to be uh, linked up with an old pal of the podcast, a columnist, an author, and novelist and broadcaster, the fantastic Laura Barton. Laura, how lovely to see you. Welcome Thank aboard. You. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. And you're somewhere, you were saying you're somewhere in Margate, is that where you are? Yes, I live in Kent. I live by the sea, yes. Do you get a view of the sea? Do you get a do you get a sea view? From the back of the house, yes. But to be honest, I don't really like the sea. I've discovered. Oh, right. <laughs> so so you move to Margate and like you don't the like the sea. sea. <laughs> I mean, Good. I what have you got against it? Pardon? What have you got against it? It's a bit wet, I suppose. It's this sea. I think this sea is sort of a mean sea. It's sort of grey, and I mean not always, but. And it smells sometimes down here. I prefer to go where I live now. I look out on a square and it's very green. And if I go for a walk, as I often do, I go across the fields in my house. Yeah. So you don't swim, obviously. I swim in the rivers that are sort of near here. That's really lovely. But it's it's um, it's very cold. Yeah, it is. How has lockdown been? Lockdown two. Have you been? What's been? What's been occurring? It's been really busy for all of the plague. And um, I'm sort of, I'm sort of a bit pissed off. About sorry, it. can I interrupt you? That's the first time in six months that anybody's referred to it as the plague. I think I'm we sure can it... it as the plague now. Oh, okay, fine. Carry yeah. on. Anyway, uh, yes, I've been really busy, lots of work. Um, uh, and I'd like, a, I took, I took last weekend off actually, and it was, it was revolutionary. It felt, um, I don't think I've done that since last Christmas, so it was really nice. Uh, but I've been regrowing my eyebrows, so sorry if anyone's watching this thinking I look like a cross between, you know, Dennis Healy and uh, Vanilla Ice. It's, it's, um, <laughs> I plucked my eyebrows in the 90s like a lot of women, and I thought this is a golden moment to regrow the Britpop eyebrows. So, um, yeah, it takes a long time. So, what happened in the 90s to make all women pluck their eyebrows? Sorry, I, I, I've missed out <laughs> on this. <laughs> no, you can join in at any time if you like, David. Um, <laughs> I think um, I think it was Kate Moss, probably. I don't know. Oh, okay. like all those sort of Britpop female bands, most of them had very thin eyebrows. Oh, and you're all copied. Um, and then, then it just looks like a surprise. Oh, I've learned so much already. You see, yep, well, this could be an. Uh, uh, I've been toying with the idea for years. I'm never going to do anything about it. Uh, uh, about writing a book about pop music and hair. Oh my because gosh, it, it's, it's all about hair. Idea. Whereas that that's a chapter. It Eyebrows. Is. Yeah. Jeez. That counts, doesn't it? Yeah, massively. Yeah. Eyebrows are a big thing, I think. Hair is such a crucial thing. I can remember interviewing Rod Stewart. I said, How long are you going to keep doing it? He said, For as long as I've got the barnet. Because oh, his whole right. idea is that without the barnet, the concept sure. of Rod Stewart does not exist. And he's right, actually. He is right. Well, you could go the Tina Turner route, I guess, couldn't he? But. What the wigs? Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> and the syrups. Yeah, it's just the wigs go back so far with Tina yeah. Turner that yeah. nobody remembers a time when it yeah, when yeah, they yeah. weren't there really. Yeah. Rod, Rod Stewart would have to go through a period of uh, recession before he'd have to don the wig, wouldn't it? And because we've all seen with rock stars, we've all seen the hair recede and then magically come back. I know. Back again. Yeah. Paul yeah. Simon, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's got a proceeding hairline. <laughs> yeah, so you've dug out some old uh, odds and ends for us. I have, yes, yes. What would you like to see first? Well, oh, I don't I... know if you've got any kind of early records. That you've... I'm trying to think where you, was it Wigan you, you grew up? Oh, I love that. Oh, them. let's see though, hang on, let's see that. This is the first record I ever bought. Oh, and God. you know, gentlemen, I so yes, I did grow up in, in Lancashire, actually, a small village near Wigan. And... Um, I bought this uh, from uh, on a, when we were on our family holiday to Anglesey, the exotic yes. <laughs> escape of Anglesey. And I bought it from uh, Woolworths in Hollyhead. And I got 50 pence off with Smash It's. And, oh, really? Um, I think it, you had to hand it in. 
and say, um, <laughs> it was probably you guys in charge of it at the time, but it was, yeah, it, would be. it would, it said something like, you had to hand it over and ha you, there was a little script that you had to say like, dear, <laughs> dear Mr. Record. <laughs> like, <laughs> probably, however that old sounds I was, like us. <laughs> no, I, um, I, <laughs> Brightly repeated this to the to the poor baffled Woolworths person in Hollyhead, and I remember my dad told me I should get the twelve inch, not the seven. So I did, and then so I went back from my um, my summer holiday with the family, and um, knowing I had this record, and I went to the community centre disco, and I was dancing to La Bamba um, with my best friend, and and we had sort of those matching sort of they were sort of tiered skirts, and everyone wore them with braces hanging down. I don't know if you remember this no, no, particular no. fashion for nine year olds in the early eighties. Um, and uh, thinking, I am it. I am like the, this is the peak of sophistication. I am now cool. And then I looked across mid La Bamba dance and I saw some teenagers in the corner who were clearly drunk, I now realise, wearing Smith's t-shirts with flowers in their back pockets. And I thought, oh, I am not cool. <laughs> Very cool. And that was a brief early lesson. Pivotal in moment in life. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so anyway, yeah, New Diamond Phillips on the cover. Hey, it's the idea of a nine-year-old's first record being a kind of cover version <laughs> of Lambamba. <laughs> I know. I have a kind of Los Angeles roots group, you know, the yeah. kind of levels of this. <laughs> Well, I mean, I was, I was into quite sort of, um, I probably knew, I did know about sort of Buddy Holly and things like that because I had a very good musical education from my parents and particularly my dad, I guess, in, that, in rock and roll. So I did already know about their story. So I think I felt some umbilical link right. to the story. I've never seen the film. <laughs> I just, I just <laughs> only record. This is the, but here are Los Lobos on the back. I seem to have written something. Oh, I've written, um, written, Oh, actually, maybe my mum has written Richie Havens across the back. I don't know what that's about. But, um, Richie Havens. What yeah. a fabulous looking band Los Lobos were. Very tight jeans. Terrifying. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. didn't, 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 don't I remember that you used to work in... Did you, did you used to work in Woolworths? I worked in Our Price and I worked in Andy's Records. It didn't work in Woolworths. Oh, right. Okay. Well, is that Andy's records in, okay. in Wigan? Southport. I worked in another independent one briefly as well, but um, I, uh, but yeah, Southport, Andy's records, that was a formative time. Were you one of those uh, kids who just, all they wanted to do was work in record shops so they could get behind the counter and play the records and so forth? Pretty much, yeah. And there's sort of always that, um, there's that lovely culture of, um, of working in a record store. This is absolutely true. And everyone always tries to capture it, whether it's, you know, High fidelity or whatever. Fidelity. Yeah, it's the obvious one, isn't it? But um, but it is such a it's a lovely club and there's sort of there's a group on Facebook now which is sort of um of people who used to work at Andy's all over the country and it does it you do feel like some connection. Oh, really? To, yeah, my best friend worked there as well, so it's lovely. So so is this is Andy's that sort of started in Cambridge. Yes, yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So they eventually were in Southport, were they? That's well, they were all over the country, yeah. Yeah. And they had a different file they're Thing was they had a different filing system i think oh was, really what was that they didn't use catalog numbers they were well, no uh, uh, out on the floor you didn't oh, do it see. The surname, you did it all by the first name it was almost like a, oh, a God. Or whatever, you but did it by the first it. name wow but if you didn't have a first name you just oh. went by the whatever the first letter is. so let's say it was um i'm trying to think <laughs> of a single band with let's say it's mark ellen you would be filed under M rather than E. Oh, right. Oh, oh my right. goodness. The old Captain Beefheart. Uh, the old Captain uh, Beefheart, Captain Sensible. Yeah, yeah. What do you do? That's mm -hmm. extraordinary. But the Isn't smell it? of record stores is still very powerful to me. Was there an element of that fantastic kind of snobbery that you got in High Fidelity? I always think it's terribly funny, that kind of slightly superior feeling that you know a bit more than the... Than a, the uh, a little bit. I think I, I always, as a, as a lady in a record store, I always disliked that but you found a sort of weird reverse that you know I was only in my teens and they couldn't you know male shoppers couldn't possibly ask a woman you <laughs> something even though you were behind the counter and clearly knew about the blues um yeah they wouldn't they wouldn't consult that's them. fascinating yeah <laughs> what because they just would feel upstaged or whatever that's threatened by couldn't compute at all 
But that's I, amazing. I, I was there when I think um, the Blur and Oasis contest was. I, um, I went and I remember queues out the door for that. I remember queues out the door for, do you remember Tony Braxton's and Break My Heart? Oh, right. Okay. And um, yeah. there was a big, in the local Northwest clubbing scene, there was sort of a remix version of that. So everyone queued in the door to get that when it came out. And then was sorely disappointed because it was just a sort of <laughs> soft ballad when they got home on their CD single. And everyone, the next week there was a queue to return the single because it wasn't. All <laughs> so yes, there were lots of, lots of little silly stories, but um, yeah, I loved them. Um, we always used to play Mud Tiger Feet when we shut up the shop at night. That was a lovely- It was to close Oh, time. lovely. <laughs> I don't know why and all dance to it, but um, yeah, they were good times. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh, God. Well, we're only mourning the other, the, I don't know how you're fixed down in Margate. You're probably surrounded by hipster record shops. But Mark and I were only mourning the other day that if we wanted to go to a record shop from where we live, well, he's in West London, I'm in North London, you'd have to go miles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, know, you well, basically you have to go to the centre of London. East, really, yeah, about as near, which is extraordinary when you think yeah. how they used to be on every corner. Most of them are now coffee shops with some records in them, aren't they? Even, the, even the I kids. suppose so. <laughs> probably, <laughs> particularly in Margate, I would imagine. Oh yeah, yeah, and a yoga studio probably as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> God. So what else you got there? What else you got? Um, well, um, I've got. Actually, I've got this. This is this is sort of a tangential thing. I, I've got. Right. I'm not really an archivist. I've just got big boxes of stuff. So in amongst, I've got sort of you know notes passed to me in class in 1984, and um, plus birthday cards, plus lo you know ticket stubs and AAA passes and whatever. So I, it's sort of been a lucky dip trying to find what no, I'm sure. trying That's to show fine. you. That's brilliant. You kept it all. What's that badge say? <clears throat> it says, "I like fist of fun." Oh it, yeah. Uh, it was a Lee and Herring thing. And this is more sort of a bone to pick. It's not music, it's, it's comedy. But um, the thing I'd wanted probably to find for you was, um, it was a little strip of paper, like a fortune cookie strip. And, um, and it was from a very early Stuart Lee show in Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Festival that I went to with my brother when I was a teenager. And um, instead of fortune cookies, he handed around um, fortune sandwiches they were like fish paste or something and inside you got your fortune and mine said well a little paper motto yeah inside the sandwich and a little picture as well mine had a little picture of craig logan from bros and then it also had the motto and it said you will never be happy and um i was probably only 15 and this is slightly um chased me throughout my life that Stuart lee has told me at an early age that i would never be happy i don't know if Stuart Lee watches these, but if he did, thank you for tainting my life, Stuart Lee, with the thought that I will, I will never be. That's appalling. <laughs> what a terrible thing to tell a 15-year-old. I don't think it was deliberate. I could have got a jolly one. I know, no, no, true. But yes, yeah. So I kept, uh, kept to that for some reason as well. But So yeah, and together with that, you had a picture of uh, of, of Craig out of out yeah. of bros yeah he's that's probably also in the box on the boxes too because yeah. the smash is they used to, who do you, they used to call craig what do they call him on they call him ken ken i think it was ken, ken <laughs> <out of Bros. laughs> i met him once and i interviewed pink and, and ken was the first thing that came into my head <laughs> thank you for that too poor guy yeah. <laughs> it's just, who was on the cover of smash it's around the time you were reading what sort of people there were a lot of kylie and jason obviously a lot of aha i was a big aha fan I was yeah. thinking about this earlier today, actually, because because um, I think I went from reading Pippin. Pippin. Do you remember wow. Pippin? So very, very vaguely. Go on. Uh, it was probably. <laughs> oh, I love being reminded of those things. Go yeah, on. and then I went to the Beena because this was one of the other things I got out to show you. This was a T-shirt I made when I was younger. You made it. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Nasha. Yeah, it says um, it's Dennis the Menace, Nasha, and. Um, and Minnie the Minx, and I'd written um, be a menace, be a minx, and on the back it said buy the beano because dandy stinks. Um, That's it, good. I, I, I got this out for you just because to show my early devotion to magazines. Um, and <laughs> to... That's fantastic. Were you a member of the Nasha Fang Club? Oh, God. I think I was at one stage. Yeah. Yes. That's probably my membership card. You probably. got a wonderful badge, a little sort of hairy Nasha badge. <laughs> yeah, very <laughs> pathetic, wasn't it? Um, yeah. So, yes. 
So where did you buy smash hits and your and your comics? Can you remember where you bought them? Were they on the news bill or did you go and get them? No, we had them delivered because I lived in quite a sort of remote oh, right. place. So um yes, it, it was Thursday. It was Thursday Smash Hits Day? That sounds about right. Yeah, 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 you, yeah, it really, it, yeah, you would have found it a bit earlier, I think, possibly, but anyway, yeah. Not, not in my remote village. But um yes. So yes, Smash Hits would arrive and it would uh I loved I mean it's shaped my language so much, you know, sort of umbong, umbongo, umbongo. They drink it in the Congo, etc. Um, bits. Corky well. O'Reilly, it's Kylie. Yes. <laughs> Okai, Jock Mackay, look at the state of the wet. Yes. Yes. It's not um, racial you... stereotyping at all. See, you couldn't do that now, could you? Um, <laughs> all the things that were funny in Smash oh, you couldn't mention. You couldn't do. You really couldn't do them. And also, I always was baffled, but could fill in the space. You know, in the crossword puzzle, one of the answers always seemed to be Lloyd Cole and the commotions. Were you aware? Because it was <laughs> Lloyd. Yeah. yeah. That would be the reason. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I knew that that's, that was the space. There was always going to be a So let, let me, while, while you're mentioning the Smash Hits crossword, I can't let that go by without mentioning that I was recently in touch with the man who used to compile the Smash Hits um, oh. Crossword and also used to do the star teaser in Smash Hits. So it's Fred Della, the great oh, mighty Fred, Fred Della. Della. The great Fred Della is still going strong. He's been in the hospital, but he's, he's I, I, I don't think I've given away any confidence when I say he's 89 years old. <laughs> but he's still working. He's probably still knocking out a crossword for somebody. He is. Probably, he's probably still yeah. putting Lloyd Cow on the yeah. commotion. One across, Umbongo, Umbongo. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> There, there are probably a whole load of uh, crossword favourites in pop groups, you know, long names with loads of vowels in them. And short ones, Aha were quite a yes, few. Yes, I Oh, yes, they were. Uh, EMI was always in there, too. Yeah. <laughs> RCA, really boring, uh, WEA, really boring things. <laughs> <laughs> Label that Talking Heads recorded for or whatever. Yes, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I'm sure this didn't happen very often with Smash Hits, but I'm generally speaking with music papers. Can you remember how sad you used to feel on the rare occasions when it didn't turn up? Mm. When there was a strike or there was a problem or God knows what. Yeah. The whole world just collapsed. I used different. to have this thing where um, on a, um, what do they call half term, they used to play the monkeys on TV, reruns of the monkeys. And on a Thursday morning, I was never happier than watching the monkeys with my copy of Smash Hits or Pippin or, or the Beatles. That does sound a dream. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, it's yeah. great. It's, it's something about those the things like the monkeys. You know, the, it's like it's like Hard Day's Night. You know, the, those um, those kind of fictional ideas of the adventures of a band. Mm. They never run out of steam, do they? Yeah. You know, so they're really appealing to people born forty years afterwards or, oh, or yeah. whatever. You know, yeah, because yeah. it's just a fantasy world. Exactly. No. It's the it's, fancy, like the fancy of the Beatles in in uh, in Hard Days Night, was it? Just so where they're all living in one flat. Yeah. You know, it's just <laughs> fantastic. It took me a long time to realise that bands didn't all live in one flat. Um, yeah. Generally, um, and I, I'm sure I'm sure Smash Hits must have sort of um, reinforced that idea. I was remembering <laughs> maybe it was maybe I don't actually maybe I started reading Looking before Smash Hits. Good, looking, yeah, I probably would have done. Yeah. yeah. I don't, so I don't know if it's looking at Smash Hits would have like a a uh, a five star feature, and obviously they all lived in one house with their cars. Oh really, right, that's true. Oh that right, was, that was what all bands did. Yeah, <laughs> and we, also, pro we, we probably also promoted it by doing uh, you know cartoon strips okay. where the Human League all lived in the same house. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Or the teardrop explodes or whatever, you know. Yeah. It was just a natural thing to want to do. That's amazing. We were obsessed with the relationships between pop stars. Pop stars. We were always talking about how Siobhan Faye was having a snog up with Bobby Bluebell of the Bluebells. <laughs> and having a snog up was such a great, great euphemism, really. I love Siobhan. Fizzy pop, too, for alcohol. Yes. The, the worst for fizzy pop. Yes. It's wonderful. Harmless fizzy pop. I used to love drawing pictures of Banana Rama, actually, they were in their cycling shorts. That was, that was something I would probably do while watching <laughs> the monkeys. Um. <laughs> so who was the first band you went to see? Can you remember? You must be able to remember. Eli Span. <laughs> no, you're kidding. Was that with your dad? <laughs> Presumably. That's so good. Eli Span, my God. I lost Lobos. Here we are. That's right. 
That's brilliant. So tell us the Cirques. I want to know where, which Steel Eyes band, which lineup, and where did you see them? Southport Floral Hall. Of course. Um, Muddy Crown must have been in them. I don't. I don't remember entirely the lineup. I was very young, but it was right. where I learnt the concept of an encore because okay. they finished. They finished the main show, and then I went to the bathroom. I heard them playing again. I was like, what is going on? Um, yeah. I didn't realise that happened at every every show, pretty much. Unless every show forever, forever <laughs> throughout <laughs> eternity. How old were you then when you would see Still Last Band? I must have been about eight or something like that. All right, okay. Mm -hmm. So it, I'm trying to think, was it the, uh, the, the point in Still Last Band's career where they were produced and managed by Mike Batt? Do you remember that? Oh, God, I didn't... Talking of unlikely kind of... Uh, was that was that around the time of was it all around my hat and all that kind of stuff, and and they they famously played a show at the Hammersmith Odeon, where the man, manager who must have been Mike Bant at the time had the idea that they, for publicity, they would shower the audience with thousands of pound notes. That's right. Do you remember this? That's right. They Cause dropped, absolute pandemonium. They dropped thousands of pound notes from yeah. presumably a net or something in the, in the in the roof of the place, and people were grabbing. You know, and a, a, a falling pound note is not an easy thing to grab. I don't think. You know, and I'm picturing you... Steely Span fans as being slight when they jump, having probably slightly sort of floaty <laughs> sleeves. Well, they've probably got a lot of bells attached to their yeah, breeches. <laughs> <That's and>... Right. <laughs> Huge floral hats. <laughs> They're all going over the, I'll go down the tube with witches' hats full of pound notes. Stuff full of loot. <laughs> That's wonderful. That didn't happen at Southport. They'd obviously run out of it. No, 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 no. Is the Southport Floral Hall still going? It always used to pop up on tour itineraries. I imagine it is. I can't it probably it. is. I hope so, yeah. Seaside towns, they tend to remain, those those places tend to remain, don't they? You know? Always the Chuckle Brothers or something. I mean, rest in peace. <laughs> died, but yes, um, <laughs> it's always someone of that ilk, isn't it? <laughs> Same here at the Winter Gardens in Margate. Um, yeah, they just chuckle. Well, along. you don't have hipster entertainment at the Winter Gardens in oh, Margate. They do. they do, of course they do, yes, inevitably. I think the Liberty is <laughs> invariably play that every other Sunday or something. Libertines and the Chuckle Brothers. <laughs> I mean, to, to please the entire community, yes. <laughs> covers, covers all bases. Have they ever been seen in the same room together, Mark? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, 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 that's no, great. No. What else have you got? Give us some other items. Uh, I've got this. Um, I'm going kind of chronological. I see. Oh, okay. yeah, that's no, good. Fine, fine, fine. Yeah, yeah. So this, um, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, the early band of Mick Hutmore from Simply Red. Oh, of course it is. Of course it was. That's yeah. right. I don't know if you will remember, but um, I'm sure I've mentioned this to you before. Um, I was deeply in love with Mick Hutton. Oh, yes, you have. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have so much Simply Red memorabilia, not all of it in my house. I think some of it's still stashed at my parents. Sorry, parents. Why, why in love with Mick Hutton? What's the matter of interest? He seems he... a funny one to choose of all the options. <laughs> is, it, is it now? When you've got Morton <laughs> Harkin over here. <laughs> She passed by Morden Harkett. To get in your rush to get to McHuckle. She made her selection without walking the full length of the counter, as we do with us. Some might say I continue to do that, too. Um, <laughs> because of his lovely hair. All oh, right. Look, my, uh, my mum is a redhead, and I, I was born with red hair, and then he went to this boring shade of mouse. But um, I love red hair, and I love curly hair. Um, so I think it was that, and I also think... I think kind of, um, here's <laughs> this is another selection of Simply Red records. Um, I think it was also that um, uh, my parents had sort of given me this grounding in, in music. There was, there was a lot of jazz and soul and blues and, and that kind of thing. And I think they kind of seemed to come together in those early Simply Red records, maybe a little bit. And the northernness obviously was attractive to me. Um, so, and also I think I liked that he seems sort of slightly misunderstood. <laughs> I think I had an early, an early childhood feeling that so he just needed a, a, a small child to, under, to understand him. <laughs> he needed someone to understand him. 
it could it's be funny how that was so attractive for, i remember in smash hits readers always fell <laughs> for the kind of uh, slightly wounded and disenfranchised and isolated the kind of mark Armand's a really good example people yeah. thought of mark Armand as needing a big bowl of chicken soup and a bit of uh, looking after you know and that was very attractive yeah. when you were you know a kid a kid yeah so um there was not anything i didn't know about mick hucknall i probably cut out all the little cartoons you did of him in, in smash hits <laughs> and um um, but then stars happened and they became massive, massive stars. And, and I found it really disconcerting that these girls in my school who'd like New Kids on the Block and Bros and whatever, um, liked my my band. And I, yeah. I, felt, I felt massive ownership of it. So I bought this probably around that time at the Corn Exchange in Manchester from a sort of secondhand record store, feeling that this was probably proof shouldn't Mick ever come to my house <laughs> that I was a true fan so you were there from the early days yeah yeah <laughs> so that's another, another that's that so did you uh, growing up with red hair did you I'm sorry I'm going back to my hair in pop thing did you did you uh, does that mean you identify with pop star the uh, I didn't have red, red hair, hair by then. Oh, okay. I, I literally was born with red hair fell out regroup boring shade of brown but my my mum has red hair so I think right. I and sort of quite she had quite big 80s red hair so right. I think I had some sort of connection <laughs> protectiveness to sort of Tapao <laughs> style red hair yeah. yes. 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 Carol, Carol, Carol Decker. Decker very Decker yeah Carol Decker. <laughs> double Decker yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic yeah. so well, what was the first big gig you went to if you if the if the Sea Lives Band was your first toe yeah, in the water so, Went to a lot of Simply Rap, probably Van Morrison. I went to oh, right. Van concerts with my parents. Um, and then, uh, yeah, probably Simply Red, those big Simply Red shows at um, in Manchester. They, I mean, they took over Old Trafford. So oh, I went to a lot crazy. of those. And then, yeah, I don't know. I went to, it was just such a part of my life from quite early on that it doesn't, uh -huh. I don't really remember sort of, now I'm allowed to go to a gig. I think it was quite unusual then in a way. There seemed such a generational divide between music taste for all my friends. You know, they, they would never go to a gig with their parents and it was such a different thing. Whereas my parents yeah. were still into music that they, we just went along with them. So, yeah. So you went with your mum and dad to see Van Morrison? Mm, yeah, many a time, yeah. Wow. Can you remember him talking to the audience? <laughs> Can you remember facing the audience? <laughs> <laughs> Just about. I mean, it was, I think I remember going to ones when he played with the Chieftains. He was a little bit more jovial in those days. I think. Oh, you have to be with the that's Chieftains. A, that's a great record. That's a the very, record he made with the Chieftains. you got Paddy Maloney there. You've got to be a you've bit You've got to be up. He oh, can't, yeah. stand, he can't stand there being grumpy. Star of the County Down, Carrick Fergus. That's a high point. Slightly forced, record. slightly forced jollity in, in the case of, of, of Van, but uh, the rest of them. I, I actually struggle a little <laughs> with some of the chief, the chieftains ones because of that. It feels like you've been made to go to a fun fair or something, and um, you will have fun. Um, so yeah, but I I interviewed him last year, and um, and he was in a foul mood throughout the interview, but also in the show that evening. And it, he finished one. I can't remember which song it was. Um, but he finished it by saying cha 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 and sort of throwing down his um, saxophone into the. I've never seen anyone put a saxophone down so angrily. It was just like the most disdainful cha cha cha. Boom. Um, yeah, he wasn't in, in fine spirits. That sounds like him in a reasonably good mood, actually. You no, know, that's the interesting thing. He's never in a middling mood, is he? You know? Yeah. No. No, it, it, most most people spend most of their lives in a middling mood, and they kind of get on with it, don't they? Van, no, if he feels himself Extreme. slightly in a bad mood, he embraces it. Yeah, I know, I know. But then you do see glimmers. You know, there's a famous um, picture of him backstage with Stephen Van Zandt and uh, Henry Hoover. Have you seen that picture? No. Well, you need to Google it. Um, but he's he's grinning. Van is grinning, and I don't know if it's Stevie. Or the Hoover that's making him so happy, but <laughs> probably the Hoover. Unimaginable. Yeah. What What else you got there? Mm, I have a um, a little. If you can see that properly, it's the Howard Johnson. All right, the motels. Um, motel from Boston, Massachusetts, and this is from when I um, 
I did an assignment for The Guardian where I drove every permutation of um, the route taken by Jonathan Richmond in Roadrunner. I remember that. That's right. Fascinating. So, yeah, and I stayed in Howard Johnson on uh, Boylston Street in Boston. Um, yeah. How was a Howard? I don't think, don't think I've ever stayed in a Howard Johnson. They're quite cheap. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the Guardian budget would have stretched, but because, um, sorry, I should have, <laughs> should have clarified, this song mentions a Howard Johnson. Yeah. So it, felt, it felt important that I stayed in a Howard Johnson. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was cheap. I mean, I didn't, because I was driving at night to recreate the song. Um, I didn't really, I just sort of slept, half slept there in the day, really. So, so he seems to fit, uh, Jonathan Richmond seems to fit your idea of the kind of slightly wounded, difficult, um, uh, lonely, isolated pop stars that you might might He's, find attractive. Well, did you did you think he was? Did you like his, his stuff a lot? Oh, I, I love um, I love him, and I um, I love Modern Lovers. Um, I was a huge Velvet Underground fan when I was when once I got over Mick, I got really into <laughs> Velvet Underground and the Pixies. Really like love affairs, aren't they? You know, they were the backwards way around. Lost Lobos. Yes. <laughs> really yeah. like Underground. Pixie, a huge Pixies fan and then probably through the Velvet Underground got into Modern Lovers um, so um, I mean I don't think Richmond was quite that same Mick Hucknall misunderstood no. he was too yeah. beamingly happy you know he famously walked on stage a couple of times didn't he, with a t-shirt he'd made himself a bit like my Dennis Menace one um, so, but it said I love my life in pencil across the front so there's probably something a bit more um, maniacally happy about him than, than my previous obsession. It's so funny. I worked with him for a while in, in sort of 1977. Yeah. And, um, and I, yeah, I was there when he, he played the Free Trade Hall in Manchester when he came over as the kind of the punk hero, you know, the conquering punk hero. Roadrunner was in the charts. And then turned up on stage with, you know, effectively an acoustic band and just and didn't want to even use the PA, really. Didn't he, uh, he once tell me he walked from the... He, from Heathrow, oh, didn't he? Did he pretty much ran from Heathrow to Kingston? Incredible. <laughs> they said, I think they'd send a car to pick him up and he said he didn't want a car. No, he, he, he was absolutely... He was the strangest person I'd ever met at the time. And nowadays you think, well, actually, I meet quite a few people who are oh, not, not like Jonathan, but a lot of things that Jonathan thought were... That at the time, well, healthy, really obsessive, absolutely, obsessive, absolutely. You know, now we're all going, that's completely fashionable. We, we're going for dinner, <coughs> with Jonathan, but we got to go to a vegetarian restaurant, and we're going, what, a vegetarian restaurant. So this is nineteen seventy-seven. Absolutely, it really was. What's that? And there aren't any. And yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, what was I going to say? And the other thing I think about a lot uh, is he used to say. I don't want to play loud music because it might hurt the ears of the little children. And, you know, we used to think, oh, Jonathan. And now I think about this all the time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you, if you go <laughs> to large the yeah, outdoor events, you see small children going around with huge, great ear protectors. You mm -hmm. tend to think, why do you bring them in the first place if you have to, <laughs> if you have to do that? You know? yeah, but I, I think Jonathan had a perfectly good point. Yeah. I would probably have to sue Steel Ice Band at some point for my hearing loss. Yeah. <laughs> Initus, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So he was... That's uh, good. Well, he, is in, he still is an exceptional character. And, uh, you know, I think, he, I think posterity will be kind to Jonathan in all kinds of ways, really. I think so, yes. Yeah. He's done all sorts of extraordinary things. Get some more things there for you. What you got there? Go on. Uh, this is a, this looks like, in case anyone ever breaks into my home, it looks like a box for a, um, a fast ethernet USB 2.0 adapter. But actually this is a, um, a, a gift from Bonnevere's dad to me. Um, so <laughs> I was the first journalist to write about Bonnevere. I remember that. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Was it about, he had a record called, was it Forever? Uh, forever ago yes um, yes and yeah. this so began my friendship with Bonadere's dad and we are sort of we've been pen pals uh, for many years now and he sent me a box of things including a quite valuable first 
uh, edition of the um, of that album. But lots of lovely pictures. I probably shouldn't, you know, it might be hurt if I start showing some. I mean, not in the dubious way. But there's some lovely pictures. Here's one of a um, of a deer in the water near where. Um, Wonderful. It was recorded. I know, it was I just, recorded in a cabin in Wisconsin. Is that yeah, so that's from, which now makes I was thinking about it the other day because it was recorded in kind of isolation. He went there for about three months, didn't he, on his own? Which now yeah. seems extraordinarily, uh, you know, in 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 key with the times. It does indeed. I I have been to the cabin now and um, a couple of times actually. And um, so yes, yeah, this box has lots of pictures from from the cabin. And, and, um, you know, it's like a sort of extra. It's like a sort of DIY box set. I guess. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, so that's one of my most treasured musical possessions. So, yes, and my first, got over there, my first gold, you know, you, um, music journalists get sent gold records, do we not? When um, when bands we have champions do really well, and, that, and the Bonnevoe one was my first gold record. So. I haven't got one. Have you got one, Mark? Have you got I've got record? one, but it's, I mean, I, I think just literally one. It was for Oh Mercy by Bob Dylan who I oh. think I put on the cover of Q magazine, which they thought contributed to its success, but I've never done anything with it. Why, why would you put that up anywhere? I really don't know. Well, you could always kid people say, Bob Dylan, you know, says, can you make sure you send Mark Gillum one? That's you know, right. He, he must have been really concerned. I owe him a second I would be nothing. Career. That's right. <laughs> and then it's time for my boot heels to be wondering. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't oh. think I've got one at all. No. I've got loads. Do you want me to send you one? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just cross out, Laura Bart. <laughs> you sent me. Yeah, lots of love. Curiosity killed the cat. Or it was. <laughs> <That's right. Yeah. laughs> bon, bon, bon Bolivon. What was what was his name? You gave oh, him? Oh, Pierre <laughs> bon v I mean, it was something like that, wasn't it? Von Pierre bon 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 And he right. always threw him on the top of a table doing his dance, like with his fancy legs. That's right. Yeah. With Whatever happened to him? Whatever happened to Curious Deal Killed the Cat? Do we ever hear from them? I don't, don't think so. No. He he um all I remember is he was occasionally signed he's still wearing a beret. But okay. I don't know if he's still that was that was the trademark, wasn't it? Hmm. They all had a trademark. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm sure the snood. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love the fact that none of these people ever stop, you know. Yes. Yeah. They, they they just keep going. And um, is Nick Kershaw one of those guys a bit like, uh, what's his face? Oh, God. James Blunt, who's kind of um, very self-effacing on the internet. If people ever get, I think he is, kind of embraces oh, yeah. it, you know. That, that's the price of fame, you know. That's fair enough. James Blunt has completely turned his whole image around. Through that, it, I, really cleverly, I think you know. Very smart. I can still remember his first comment: someone having a go at him for one of his sort of mawkish songs he'd written and saying how ghastly it was. And uh, he said, uh, "Yes, but I'm mortgage-free." I thought that was just such a great phrase, just to remind you that there are advantages about writing a really <laughs> big hit. Fox, isn't he? He's like, um, yeah, he's, 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 yeah, he turned it all around. He did. He did. Uh, I don't know where we're up to in time. I've got loads of bizarre things here. Go on, show us. These are show great. Us something so bizarre, go on. Yeah, come on. Here's a, here's a suite that I got at a, a white stripe show. Oh, um, fantastic. I should le eat that live. Um, here's, here's a compilation tape from, from an early boyfriend. Um, from an early boyfriend? Yes, yeah. What sort of, what sort of music on it? Uh, we've got everything from uh fashion crisis hits new york we've got um firestarter we've got birdhouse in your soul uh, oh know, yeah mike the giants yeah 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 i mean i've got loads of compilation stuff did you ever use the only tape? bee in your bonnet what a great line that is lovely one, isn't it? did you ever record. did you ever make tapes for boys oh yeah yeah and it was sort of in that age at that point you uh, you had to always put some slightly comic thing on there as well. So it was sort of, you know, I had um, an all aboard tape that we'd have when we were children so with all kinds of bizarre recordings on or a um, uh, well, the wisp tape. And you had to put, you know, weird little snippets of, you know, Mavis Cruitt on there or something just to 
I don't I don't really know what that was about, but everyone did it. Just to lighten. Did you have to agonise about the, first, the choice of the first track? <clears throat> because that first track always sent out a certain message. Though. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I learned that early, actually, because with some friends we used to do play at radio stations. I probably got the tapes of that, actually. Radio 10. And we nearly always used to start with uh, Vanessa Paradis, uh, Jola Taxi, because it has that sort of seagull sound. It's right. a nice little intro to her. Do a radio show. I've never done that on actual radio, but um, yeah, yeah. What else? I've got a badge here from when I interviewed um, uh, Yoko Ono. Uh, oh, right. What's it Good say? Lord, how was that? Uh, she was. Uh, she was. She was lovely, actually. Um, she gave me this badge, a little torch, which you I probably have somewhere, and um, you had to. She showed me how you're supposed to go. I love you with it um and then she also goes <laughs> it was, i think it was at the moment that was hilarious that expression <laughs> <laughs> i was probably, I probably kept it together in her presence but um uh there was a fruit bowl in the hotel room where i was interviewing her um and it had on top you know one of those sort of is it fasalis or cake gooseberry things those, yeah yeah she gave me that as well which is that's i don't still have that but um yeah, no, she was nice. It was sort of, it, there was a period of time where I did a lot of interviews with people who are creative individuals in their own right, but um, who were also rock widows. So I think I did Yoko, Courtney Love, Deborah Curtis in quick succession. Uh, um, yeah. You've got to be careful, Yoko Ono, with the fruit bowl. You know, is it an exhibit or is it just. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Kate that, Gooseberry, I'm surprised she didn't tell you to kind of plant it and then, uh, you know, imagine that it were, your thoughts were like confetti and you were living in a, some kind of... Maybe that was implicit. I should have taken it as read and I, I blew my chance to have... Tony, Tony King, who, who uh, worked for all kinds of people, Elton John and uh, John Lennon and Mick Jagger and so forth, told me once that he lived in... He was in the Dakota with John and Yoko must be in the I don't know, late 70s or something. And they were out and he just decided he was going to clean. <laughs> Tony being terribly house proud <laughs> and just <laughs> washed up a few things. And uh, uh, she came back and she said, Tony, where's my sculpture? <laughs> and he said, what? She said, glass of water. <laughs> oh, you're kidding. <laughs> yeah, he just, I drank it. You <laughs> <laughs> do that out. <laughs> Swished it round. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. uh, apocryphal, possibly, but good story. Um, very good story. <laughs> That's yeah. a great story. Uh, so, have yeah. you been working on any, any radio while you've been uh, in this? We're just, uh, we're just during the break. The sort of commissioning round, as you may know, I don't know, for a yeah. minute. So, we, I've got lots of things possibly be made right um, yes you've written loads of proposals to get loads of producers of off the hook your and, name yeah. has been attached to yeah. all sorts of things <laughs> yeah, that yeah, you, exactly. you think are very yeah. unlikely it's independent producers easy. just think oh that's the job done laura's doing 10 proposals whoosh put those that's in one yeah. might get picked up yeah. yeah we'll see how that i mean i do a podcast for toast um which has been quite amazing. oh yes i saw yeah. this now toast this is this give them a plug it was the fashion brand Fashion and lifestyle, yes. Oh, so, okay, uh, sorry. Uh, I know them for scarves and gloves and things like yeah. that. Um, so what do you do? What's the podcast? What do you do? I read about it, mentioned it somewhere. Anyway, go on. Uh, just have a chat with people. <laughs> so right, okay. <laughs> what kind <laughs> so of people? You've had everyone from, you know, there's been quite a lot of authors, so, but um, Max Porter, Helen MacDonald, um, Claire Tomlin, uh, Emma right. J. Lansworth. We've had a few musicians, um, and Appeal was one of them, um, and artists, and um, I think there will be musicians next. But um, yeah, it's just a, it's just an interesting conversation with creative people about their lives. They're, right. they're quite gentle, but they're quite nice. Um, I should probably be more effusive about this. They're really good. Uh, <laughs> they're very well produced. So I've been doing no, that. you can't oversell toast. It doesn't work at all. It doesn't, no, you know, it's, really it's got to be comforting and warm, and you know that's mm -hmm. fair enough. Mm. Yeah. So I've been doing that, and yeah, a bit of radio. I do stuff with Josie Long's shortcuts sometimes, and um, uh, lots of journalism. I just interviewed ACDC recently, and um, and then 
uh, I'm doing this film project, just loads of stuff really. I do lots of, and then I do some A and R for um, Christmas records, and um, yeah, lots of. But you've been doing doing everything on Zoom, presumably. Yes, which makes doing A and R quite a challenge. But um, yeah. somebody tweeted a fantastic thing the other day of, of two Australian guys showing you how you can sound like uh, ACDC in thirty seconds. It's a little bass pattern, a little drum pattern. They only have three guitars. I think it's a, a C, A and G, or three chords rather. Yeah. And then a lyric about um, a dog in the road sung in the style of, uh, of, of um, Marge Simpson. Marge <laughs> Simpson is the key point. That Marge is... Simpson, and they just put this together and it's just terribly funny. And actually it, it does sound exactly like them. It, just it, the it was lovely. I mean, they were, they were on fine form and... Um, and because I was uh, caught in traffic, I had to interview them while sitting in my car. I had to put my laptop in my car, and um, but they they didn't seem to mind. It was, it was... You're in the car, your laptop, and so where were ACDC? They were in America in their homes, and I was oh. sitting. So they were they were in different homes. Yes, they don't live together. It's not like the. Most... No. <laughs> <laughs> Although, imagine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, in all my shorts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, um, Florida and North Carolina, Nashville. Um, yeah. It was. It was a nice. It was an unusual experience. But I think that's one of the things at this time. You know, you just very quickly get used to doing the Zoom interviews. That's really, I suppose you do. Yeah. That's extraordinary. Incredible. I mean, if, you, if you'd said that to anybody. At the enemy in 1976. <laughs> yeah. Somebody you know, was sitting in, stuck in traffic, they, talking to two members of ACDC they, in America. Overseas, in different places. Yeah. And you'll see them. <laughs> you know. Yeah. That's absolutely amazing. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Modern science. I do miss going. I mean, I miss, I'm normally traveling quite a lot, and I do miss that. And I miss meeting people. You know, the hard thing is if you're writing a lot of interviews, um, the lack of colour from, from yeah, oh, absolutely. How someone, you, I could describe, you know, your backdrops, but that only takes up a short. Uh, yeah, I know. But you miss the, just being in somebody's presence and all their mannerisms and what yeah. they're wearing and the details of their homes and uh, there's so much loss. Oh, because okay. that's most of it. Well, it goes back to the thing we've said loads of times on these things, is that with rock stars. You don't really want to enter, interview them at all. You want to look at them. You want to just sit you and observe. To, you them. want to be with them and yeah. you just notice how they interact with each other. Exactly. That's what you write about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or what? Or what drink they order? Or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely. It's tone well, of the fact voice. that the phone rings and they answer the phone very briefly and say, "I'll ring you back," and it's who they're talking to and how they talk to them. Just yeah. so much information. And all that's kind of lost. In fact, what they say, what they say is largely unimportant because it's probably oh. what they said to the person they, who interviewed them 10 minutes ago and what they're about to say to somebody in half an hour. Completely that. I was remember interviewing Tom Jones and I think he'd been told to be on his best behaviour because I was a female journalist and, and The Guardian. So he couldn't be in any way fruity with me. But um, <laughs> then the waitress came over and he was a little bit with her and I was, it was just a beautiful moment. He was like a child sitting on his hands, do you know what I mean? He just couldn't... <laughs> That is rich. That's I'll sit really, on his hands. Suddenly <laughs> fruity with the waitress. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. So who's the worst person you've ever interviewed? Well, Van was awful. I mean, I, I walked out on Van. Oh, was... did you? Yeah. Yeah. What did he do to make you walk out? Was it something he said or just he was being uncooperative generally? Or was there a moment when it all snapped? Yeah, he was. Bit, it was a very weird setup. I mean, I, the piece is in the Guardian, but it was sort of um, they'd already. It took a lot to get this interview. I mean, every single time he had an, an album out, I um, would pitch for it. And I'd watched loads of other journalists interview him who didn't really, I know, didn't know a lot about Van, but they were all men. There was one time that I um, he did this jazz an album, and, and management, his management asked um, how much I knew about jazz, and I had to sort of send my jazz CV. That said. Crazy stuff. Anyway, um, eventually we get this interview, and it's in Cardiff in this hotel room, and it's delayed by an hour. I've learned that morning, and later I, I conclude it's because he's in a foul mood. But his managers stay in the room, which is very unusual in the modern age for man for anybody to stay there. And they were just sort of sitting on the bed, and Van sits there and he takes down a, a, a notepad from the 
table of pennies in case he wants to make some notes. And I realize he's serious, you know, he's, he's just in such a terrible mood. And um, he just was so deeply uncooperative, didn't want to say anything, was, um, he accused me of doing a psychiatric examination of him. Yeah. I mean, it was just, in the end, I just thought, I'm not going to get anywhere. And um, I just said, should we, should we call it a day, basically, and walked out. I mean, I love, he's, he's one of my favourite songwriters no, in the world. Sure. So it is yeah. one of, and he probably knew that, and that was probably half the reason why he didn't want me to interview him. Um, but yeah, I just thought, I mean, I knew lots of cases of him walking out of interviews himself. So probably I had to. Did you ever interview Lou Reed? No. I mean, obviously he's. Because that might have been the same, because you obviously adore Lou Reed. I think you might have found that a bit disconcerting. Oh, I know. Yeah. I remember Simon Hattenstein at the Guardian. He, he cried, I think, because Lou was so mean to him. <laughs> Beastly I mean, to him. Yeah, beastly. Um, <laughs> yeah, they, they, I mean, it was almost funny because it was just such a performance of, you know, of absolute hulking rudeness. So, yeah. yeah. And Johnny Burrell walked out of an interview with me because I knew more about beat writers than him. Johnny Burrell from Razorlight. Um, but those are my two, yeah. Because the, the, the irony about Lou Reed that we often remark on is that nobody ever paid more prs to put him in more rooms with more journalists than lou reed that's oh, yeah. what he did yeah you, know, you could argue that without the press telly. he didn't yeah. go on telly he didn't he didn't take adverts on the tubes mm. he gave interviews to the enemy the guardian the melanie maker time out whoever else would have him and mm. then complained about it after having paid a pr to get those people to interview him but also without the press, Vel Velvet Underground quite possibly would never exist. have made it because they're a group Doesn't that exist. needed explaining. They weren't self-evident at all. You, you know, you needed the sleeve notes. You needed yeah. to read about them to understand what, what, the, what the idea was. Actually, I tell a lie, I did meet Lou once, but I was, it was something to do with Laurie Anderson. And he was really nice because it was about her, not about her. Yeah. All uh, right, right. Yeah, that's, that's it. So at the end of the Van Morrison thing, did you exchange a stilted handshake? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I, so... I, was, I was like, I'm just not going to rise. I just was sort of treating like a child. You know, if you're going to behave like that, I'm going <laughs> to. But also be as courteous as you possibly can while being slightly steely. And um, so I shook his hand. Um, and um, I'd asked him why, oh no, he said, he was saying, um, he was asking why I was asking these questions. And I did tell him he'd been, his music had meant more to me than, than any other in the world. And he didn't know what to do with his face. It was a really interesting moment. Yeah. And then yeah. I called it the day. I stood up and he shook his hand. And on his little notebook, I wrote in the piece that he'd, he'd drawn an angry rectangle because he, he had just been, that was all he'd done on his notebook was just go over and over and over this, um, was it an angry? Yeah, right, rectangle. Um, yeah, and then just walked out, went back to my hotel room, cried, and then left. Okay. It's funny, Mario Reardon, who Mark and I both work with, uh, the editor of various magazines, Mario said something to me years ago. It slowly made an impression on me. She said, one of the most important things in life is to know how to be able to take a compliment. Yes. And Van Morrison cannot take a compliment, can't deal with it, and gets loads of them. Mm. And the more there are, the way you just oh, can't way. find a way of just receiving it. Um, uh, yes. A friend of mine uh, wanted to make a film about everyone who'd ever been sort of let down by Van Morrison, whether that was journalists or people he was meant to work with. And I always remember David Holmes telling me that he had gone for a meeting with Van. They live near each other. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, David. Sorry if you're watching this. But um, he... Um, uh, and Van came to pick him up and they went to a cafe, but Van had too much stuff on the front seat of his car. So David had to sit in the back, like Van was mini cab driver. <laughs> and then they just, yeah, they discussed this project. And I think, I think David booked at the studio and all the musicians and Van clearly didn't turn up. So, yeah. yeah. And fits with that theory that, that people are frozen uh, in terms of their emotional development at the time they first become famous. Because he was actually a very, very, pretty big local star certainly when he was 16 <laughs> and a big international star when he was 18 90. yeah it's kind of forever been a kind of truculent teenager who's never kind of developed yeah 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 
So, Laura, we, we, we tend to traditionally climax these uh, exchanges by asking people to tell us what is the greatest record ever made. Now is your opportunity. That's a lovely segue because uh, I would say Astral Weeks. Oh, OK. Oh, fantastic choice. Thank you. Thank you. Any particular reason why that one and not, uh, you know, Moon Dance or whatever? I mean, the rival for me would probably be Into the Music, but... Um, but Astral oh, really? Weeks, oh, well. Yeah, and, and the last sort of run of three songs on that I think is sublime but um I think it is such a world in a, of its own and I love those kinds of records we mentioned Bon Iver forever earlier I think that's a similar one where it feels a bit like a song cycle almost and you step into that world so completely um and it feels as if you have sort of walked into um something completely a, a, I don't want to say a dream but something so bewitching so captivating and intoxicating that um um, you can't, I mean, I know lots of people hate it, but for me, it's also... Who hates it? Who hates it? Oh, story? I know lots of people who hate it. Um, Impossible to hate. Well, one of my favourite radio producers, he uh, he hates it. He, he, is, um, he was a music student. He says it's partly, I think, because of the flute is out of tune or something. Um, oh. <laughs> um, but it's also one of those records that is a big link with my parents, because, and I would hear it late night, you know, floating up through the floorboards, and it's such a... Especially yeah. my family yeah. too. So, yeah. I was I was on a radio program with John Franson, the novelist, and he just finished a book. And I said, "Do you listen to music when you're writing?" And he said, "I listen to one record. Oh just yeah, that, one record. I, I, After I, weeks, yeah. just play it again and again. And again. I do that because there's kind of nothing else you can play really. What you what you get on that? What do you listen to, life? Laura? I have certain songs that are very, that, um, I have a little playlist, a good song. But I mean, lately, the other times it's just, I can entirely step into one song for one stretch of writing or one piece or one chapter or whatever. So I lately have been writing a lot to Bill Ryder Jones, um, the Yawn Yawn version of um, Don't Be Scared, I Love You, which is- Aren't you distracted by songs with lyrics? I feel like I can only write to instrumental music. They have to be the right tone of voice which is somehow better for me than, than instrumental music. Yeah. So Cat Power, uh, Van I can do, um, Bruce when he's doing sort of Stolen Car era, um, or any river, uh -huh. so nothing too bombastic. Um, yeah, those kinds of, uh, Bill Callahan, yeah. So that sort of slightly dusky, low voice, largely male. Um, uh -huh. yeah. Wonderful. Well, uh, we'll, we'll, that we'll, was great. We'll let you get on with it. Yes. What are you, Thank what you are so you, much. What are you doing next? What are you doing for the rest of the day? You're not going swimming. I've got a couple of meetings. Um, not no. I've got a couple of meetings uh, and some writing to do. Yeah. All right. Okay. I've got some edits to. I've got this book out next year, so I've got some edits on that. And then. Oh, uh, what's your book? What's the book? It's called Sad Songs. Oh right. It's about music and sadness, and it's a memoir. So yes. Oh. And so when when do you is that definitely coming out in spring? Is it? Should be, yeah, yeah. If I can get a wriggle. Um, yeah, and then I've got this film project. I've got to do a treatment thing for. So yeah, right. right. Deadlines galore. Okay. Wonderful. Oh, really nice to talk to you. That was terrific. Nice to Thoroughly talk to entertaining. You. Thank you, and uh, yeah, um, thank you for shaping my my childhood with with your <laughs> <laughs> bongos. The stupid jokes. Our own bongo. <laughs> to my brain. Thank you very That's much. Great. All right. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view.